So welcome to AI Insights with John Rose. In honor of Earth Day, we're going to do a, a special episode uh, focused on power and cooling and environmentals, you know, yeah. something that's super important. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting how dominant this topic of where's the power going to come from, how do I cool this stuff is in the broad dialogue around AI. And so today I invited Vivek, who runs corporate strategy at Dell, uh, my partner in crime on a lot of different things, to, to join me because... I think there's a little bit of myth busting that's needed here and that we need to really think uh, you know, about the fact that in one dimension, power and cooling are not gigantic obstacles for most early enterprise adoption, even though a lot of people would make it appear that they are. On the other hand, long term, we have to have AI architectures and systems that are ultimately get trending towards higher degrees of efficiency and are able to navigate the limitations of our power and cooling environments. And so we're going to talk about both today. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully by the end of it, you'll feel like in the near term, this is not as big of an issue if you're an enterprise doing stuff. Um, if you're building a, you know, a million node cluster to train models, it's a big issue. But at the same time, it also has to be part of your strategic thinking because yeah. there are approaches that are much bigger than just which GPU you choose or which power and cooling technology you adopt. Um, so, so maybe, Vivek, let's start with, you know, why is there so much noise around power and cooling right now? Yeah, John, I'm telling you, you know, I trained as a chemical engineer and I joined a company like Dell and I thought I would not be talking about cooling. <laughs> but guess what? You know, I'm back in my cooling land. Yeah. But all kidding aside, you're right. I think this has taken the life of its own. Yeah. And why is that? Because a lot of our narrative is dominated by these big training workloads, large language models. And you go back and look at it, uh, last year in 2024, global data centers, AI and non-AI, consume 400 terawatt hours of energy per year. Yeah. By the end of the decade, that's kind of supposed to go up to 1,100. Hmm. And if you just look at the delta, the 700, if that were a standalone country today, that'll be like number five or number six hmm. in terms of energy consumption. And then when you mirror that with the supply side of the equation, by and large, the generation and transmission capacity have not kept up. And that's what's causing this massive, what's happening with power and cooling. You know, go back to the hopper class of uh, GPUs, which is, you know, like N minus two at this point, you drop a 100,000 cluster uh, H100 GPU cluster, it consumes 1.6 terawatt hours of energy per year. You drop one in Austin, or you drop eight of them in Austin and we are done. We have no power for anything <laughs> else, including the lights and whatever we're doing over here. That's why this has caught so much imagination. Yeah. But to your point, I think which is the really important point, this should not freeze people out yeah. because there's a whole spectrum over here. What do you want to do with AI? What are the choices in terms of executing it? Are you training? Are you inferencing? And gosh, most of the enterprise AI, you and I have talked about it, is all about yeah. inferencing. And you have a whole spectrum of power available to do that between your data centers and your PC. But there is no mistake. This has taken on a life of its own and has consumed yeah. a lot of uh, attention and my fear is that it's freezing out companies yeah. unnecessarily at this point. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I think I, I, we play in all three AI markets, the yeah. non-gen AI market, the training market, and the enterprise market. So we have to navigate all of them. And, but in this topic, if you're in the training market, this is a strategic issue. We have got to find new sources of energy, whether it's small reactors or fusion energy at some point, because the growth curve is pretty, yeah. pretty spectacular and, and pretty complex. The minute you pop over to the enterprise market, though, what we've learned and shared with you is, look, enterprise use cases are tied to the improvement of a specific process in a specific part of your business. Even if you affect a lot of, a lot of people in your organization, the actual specific amount of compute needed to solve something like adding coding assistance to your development environment or improving your services capability are actually reasonably small. It could be literally a handful of GPUs needed to run that one workload. Now, you immediately have a reaction saying, well, oh, that, that seems like enterprise isn't small. Well, there are literally, in a company like Dell, probably a million processes yeah, that absolutely. exist, and each and every one of them could be made better with AI but as we've talked about, picking the right ones is critically important. It was important to make sure that we focus our energy on them, our human energy, but it's also important to realize that within the existing power budget you have in your data centers or what's accessible to you, picking the right workloads that will have the biggest impact is also likely going to be the ones that you can do within the envelope without hitting any of these issues. And so, you know, for us, honestly, uh, you know, we think that there's a lot of noise uh, in the system. And that noise is mostly because people are confusing the training and inferencing yeah. worlds. 
But as you work in the enterprise space, the number one thing that can help you not run into an unexpected power and cooling issue is to be very, very careful about picking which workloads and use cases and processes you're going after. And our experience has been, for all the stuff that we've done at Dell, like 100,000 people using AI effectively, materially changing their work, we've been able to do that within the power and data center envelope of the company before we started this journey. There will come a point where we do run out of capacity, yeah. And then we'll have to navigate that, but that should not freeze you from getting started. And by the way, by the time you did it, the amount of AI you produce, or the amount of ROI you produce, will be more than sufficient that you'll have resources to be able to navigate that future issue. So don't don't pause because you might think there will be an energy problem in the distant future, and don't get confused about the problems of the large training infra infrastructures versus the inference environment of the enterprise. You're, you're spot on, and I think John to that point, I think. As you and I talked about it, we surveyed 3,800 customers globally yeah. across five different countries. An interesting stat popped out. 39% of the power envelope within an existing data center is currently not used. Yeah. And we also know that traditionally IT has followed the sweat the asset mentality, which is, you know, in our parlance, a lot of these 13, 14 generation servers, which are much less efficient compared to the 17 generation, yeah. are still sitting in these data centers. So as you and I have talked about it, you've got all this power available today. And once you, once you actually thoughtfully think about where you want to deploy it, and then within this existing envelope, and you think about the PCs as well, boy, there's a lot of ROI to be had. Mm -hmm. And then when you step back and say, hey, instead of setting these assets, if I could swap six or eight of these for one of the latest generation, how much additional power do I liberate? Right. And what else can I do? There is a lot that can be done, but unfortunately, I think the entire uh, mind, mind share has been taking up with these large language models, this big talk about power that enterprises are missing the opportunity that, you know, thankfully we are being very surgical and smart about yeah. it. And, you know, and interesting enough, there are so many tools you can use yeah, in the AI journey to stay ahead of this, this issue, to basically make sure that your power and cooling and space are being used efficiently. You mentioned some. Look, We've seen tremendous improvements on core count per processor, yeah. on storage data reduction rates, on network densification. If you build a modern infrastructure today, it is probably two to three times more dense in the same power envelope in terms of how many workloads it can run of a system that you've deployed maybe three or four years ago. And so if you don't have enough capacity in your data center, going and modernizing your data center could free up that capacity. In addition, we know that as we move into Agentic, which is kind of the next big frontier for all of us, if you assume that all agents are going to run in a data center, you're doing it wrong. Agentic's, Agentic architectures can be distributed, and we know that if you push them out onto the device into an AI PC or an AI work, or workstation, you have an ability to basically shift power consumption out of the data yeah. center. In fact, a lot of us say for many Agentic workloads, up to 80% of the power consumed in the end-to-end -end workload will happen on the PC and not on the data center. That's a huge value. You know, and then and then beyond that, we have a continuous improvement on the energy efficiency yep. of both algorithms and the GPUs themselves. You know, look, a GPU produced three years from now, I, I can't even calculate it, but will be so much more efficient in terms of the MIPS per watt that you might only need one of them in place of maybe five or six Absolutely. or ten that you're using today. And so the reality is we as an industry get it. We're bending the curve towards more efficient use of the, the, the environment that we have. Uh, the demand is bigger than the supply, so this is going to be a growth curve. But you as an enterprise should not freeze. You should not pause. You should not think of this as an insurmountable obstacle because it isn't. You have choices. And by the way, the last choice you have is if you can't do it yourself in your own data center, there is this entire industry called co-location that has some of the most efficient and green environments. There are some data center providers in the co-location space get 100% of their energy from renewables. Right. And if you're concerned about that, well then put your AI resources there. They're very good at it. So again, on one side, if you're building out the biggest cluster in the world, you have a lot of things to navigate and we're doing that. On the other side, if you're an enterprise, that is not your world. There are lots of tools, lots of choices, lots of capabilities, and it should not stop you from going after those high priority workloads. No, you're, you're spot on and I think John, we talk a lot about this, and you touched on the algorithmic innovation part of it. Yeah. It is mind-boggling on a daily basis how much there exists, and we talk about it, right? You look at these small language models through all of these techniques that are coming about, which are far more performant and far lower power yeah. envelope, including many of them moving to the devices. So the choices are pretty broad, yeah. 
And I think your main message, which I love, is don't stop, don't get frozen out by this, yeah. because this is sort of a head fake, but you have to think through which use cases, where do you best deploy it, and guess what? There's a ton of ROI to be had, so even if you're the one watching the dramatic pace at which all this is evolving, there's a lot of value to be captured in a very short amount of time, and if you're not moving, we know your competitors are, so you better get on with it. So exactly. I love those messages. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great, great end state. I mean, look, at the end of the day, you know, we are delivering technology in the real world. The real world is bounded by things like energy capacity and environmentals. Hopefully, from this discussion, you know, maybe you learned a few things that you didn't know, and that is that you have tools, you have choices, but more importantly, the big power issues for the enterprise are not now. They might happen in the future, but that shouldn't be an impediment for you to get moving. And fundamentally, you have a lot of tools and more tools coming at you almost every day to make AI more efficient. You know, like I'm a technologist, and you know, every technology when you first create it is sloppy and inefficient and just kind of good enough to, to show the prove the point. AI, especially generative AI, is now maturing. And when that happens, we get very creative at the engineering level. We yeah. optimize semiconductors, we optimize software, we find ways to make these systems run efficiently. And at the end of the day, every time we do that, we end up with more capacity than we could imagine, and that spawns entirely new impacts that we couldn't imagine either that really change the world. So, you know, it's going to be a going to be a fun uh, fun journey. But again, don't pause. Energy is not the problem you have to deal with right now. It's really about knowing where to target your energy or target your human energy to apply your actual energy to get things into production and, quite frankly, start getting value out of your AI solutions. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Rivik. All right. Thanks a, thanks a lot. Good to see you.